They keep trying to hack me, so might as well turn it into an educational video and workshop. Just received this email from Blackmagic Design, which is the company behind the popular editing software DaVinci Resolve. And this one is actually quite well formatted. As you can see, it's sent by Sarah White. I hope this message finds you in high spirits. My name is Sarah, and I'm the PR manager at Blackmagic Design. We're following your channel and would like to offer a partnership with us. Then it tells me about DaVinci Resolve. It says they're interested in a full review or a 60 second pre-roll. I don't do either of those, but a lot of YouTubers do. The price will vary depending on the type of advertising or apply for more information. Thank you for exploring this opportunity. This is actually the best formatted email I've ever seen from people trying to send me malware. Off the top, there's nothing that's really suspicious over here, except the domain. Now, this could obviously be a PR firm's domain, so that's not necessarily immediately a red flag. But then if we go ahead and try to visit this, as you'll see, it's a weird Japanese website that has nothing to do with PR. But I did reply to their email saying, send me your offer, and I got this in return. So they sent you to a Google Drive link, and if you open it, there's uh, something called a YouTube deal, which is uh, a zip file. And inside we have a promotional video and then the agreement. SCR. Now, one of the things we're going to do in this video is we're going to analyze these files and I'm going to tell you how you can tell if somebody's sending you malware beyond just the superficial indicators like the file type. Of course, it shouldn't be an SCR if it's a PDF, but as you can see, once you extract this, it does look like a PDF and a lot of marketing execs, they are not going to know what an SCR file type is. They might think it's similar to PDF or some kind of document extension, but of course on Windows, this is going to act like a full executable application. Another thing to note is the size is 658 megabytes. But one of the things I want to do is to compare this contextually with an actual PDF file, just to show you the differences so you understand how files work. So this is a real PDF file, Shakespeare's plays. Well, thankfully, they're not gonna be encrypted by ransomware in this video. But the interesting thing, of course, is since I have Edge as the default application, they even show up differently. I'm guessing this is trying to mimic the Acrobat icon. So if I had Acrobat installed on the system, they would probably look very similar. But none of that really matters because if you you look into the file content, you're going to be able to tell that these are entirely different things. And I'm going to show you how. So if we open up a hacks editor, now this can be anything, you can even open it up in notepad if you like. But if we compare the actual bits of the data, got both of them side by side, I'm just going to go into analysis, data comparison, and we'll just tile it horizontally. And that should be good. And now you can actually see the data inside the file once it's decoded to text. And you clearly see the differences. One file starts with mod PDF, creator, Mozilla, 5.0, Macintosh, Apple WebKit. So this is essentially giving us the metadata, generation data for the PDF, creation date. This is what a PDF heading is going to look like the first bits of data when you actually read this. On the other hand, this other thing that may look like a PDF on the outside, inside, it starts with MZ. Those are actually the initials for the guy who came up with the MS-DOS executable format. And then we've got this program cannot be run in DOS mode. And then we've got a PE and then some other data. Now this is the starting signature of a portable executable format or an EXE on Windows. And just like that, by looking at the data inside an application, the starting of the data, you can tell what a file actually is. Now, of course, you could have done it much more easily just by going into properties and looking at the extension, but you never know. In the future, they might find a way to mask that or make it even more confusing. But this method is always going to work. They cannot hide the actual signature inside the file. They cannot change the actual file structure because then the application is not going to work. If it's an actual PDF, it's gonna behave like a PDF. Now, as usual, Another thing about this file is that most of it is empty space, unlike the real PDF file, which is filled with real data, because guess what? When we open this, we've got tons of text in it. All of this is data that needs to be stored. Whereas in this, it's only pretending to be a 600 megabyte file so it can escape the scanners. 
but the actual malicious code does not take up that much space. So there's a little bit of code and then a bunch of crap at the very end. In order to analyze this, I'm just gonna try to find the tail of it and then delete the rest and then save it. And you'll see how much size we're able to drop off that way. Say we start from here, we're done and if we just go ahead and save it it's going to create a backup of course but uh, it's going to take a while because we're deleting a ton of data here hundreds of megabytes literally but when it's done as you can see we've reduced the size to only 15 megabytes and what amazes me though is that it is still very easy to share such files via google drive Google hasn't found the technology to be able to scan large files inside archives. And at the end of day, it may never be possible to do that. So this is going to be a very potent threat factor for everyone. So if you're getting any kind of archive via Google Drive, any kind of online cloud sharing platform, do not open it especially if it's password protected, because what that means is that the file cannot be analyzed. If you must open it, then at least do what I did and look into the actual contents of the file before you double click on it. This may not work on people like me who did malware analysis as a job, but if I was, let's say, a gaming YouTuber or even worse, a cooking YouTuber, somebody who is not necessarily spending a ton of time understanding files and things on Windows, it would be very natural for me to just open up the agreement just to see what it is in the moment. This is exactly how Linus got hacked. One of his employees, who again is a marketing exec, may not be an expert on tech, ended up opening a similar file. Now, every time I make one of these videos, there's always a lot of comments saying, well, this is not really useful to me because what you said, that mumbo jumbo, it makes sense to you. It does not make sense to me. And I totally understand if you're a lay person and you're looking at this hex editor view, you are not going to be able to make sense of this stuff that you're seeing. Unless you've studied file types, you're not going to know that this is how a PDF starts and that this is how a PEEXE starts. This is stuff you have to learn or you learn from experience. But if you don't want to do that, then you can obviously rely on a secondary source for the analysis. So you can upload the file to Vars Total. But of course, it's going to be challenging if the file size exceeds 650 megabytes because Firestall is not going to be able to analyze it. I wonder why it's 658 megabytes and not 649 or 630. This is exactly what the attacker is counting on. They're counting on the fact that you're not going to be able to analyze it on Firestall. The cloud scanners are not going to be able to analyze it because they're relying on similar APIs and similar scanners. They're going to have size limits. And even your antivirus is not going to be able to do a quick cloud lookup. So if it's an AV like Windows Defender that heavily relies on cloud lookups, you may not be able to look up a file that's this big. And as a result, it's going to bypass all of those defenses and go straight through. But by using the technique I just showed you, you can reduce the size and then it's going to be analyzed by everybody. It's also worth noting that this is why I recommend having a good real-time antivirus that's analyzing your processes because it's actually running on your system for real, checking the actual code that's being executed. And that is not the same as looking up a file in the cloud. It's a totally different thing technically, but in any case, just be really careful with password protected archives. First total is pulling up some nice detections for it. A lot of scanners are detecting it. Microsoft detects it, of course, as a Trojan, Emsil, Sotos Kaspersky flags it as a stealer, but that's still only 25 engines out of 70 that are able to detect this file even after I've reduced the size. And this is again to show that the cloud implementation of engines is not really the best way to detect sophisticated malware. Often doesn't work. Now, if we go ahead and run this with Process Explorer open, it's going to load up and disappear. But what it's doing essentially is trying to harvest all the credentials on this machine, do its job very quickly, send the data to the attackers. You may have realized it's just a virtual machine. But essentially, it's probably looking for browser credentials, trying to see if my YouTube details are in there and it's gonna send it straight to the attackers and then they can hack my YouTube channel. Maybe upload some crypto scams for you guys. But hopefully this shows how difficult 
uh, it can be sometimes to figure out if something is malicious or not. And again, I've worked as a malware analyst. Everybody's not going to have the experience to know each of these small details. And the emails don't always look silly. As you can see, this is a pretty professional looking email. It's not all that different from the standard sponsorship emails I get. And I do get emails from domains that are not associated with the company because a lot of the times the companies have a PR agency or a third party marketing agency agency that's doing sponsorships for them or acting on their behalf to get influencers. So it is not uncommon to get an email about a company ad that's not from that company itself. The subject is a bit weird though. Advertising co-location <laughs> with Blackmagic Design instead of collaboration. Well, you know what? Now that there's chat GPT and everything else, it's easier than ever to generate legit looking emails or legit looking sponsorship inquiries. So even if the creators can't figure out how to learn English in 20 years, they can just outsource that problem to chat GPT. I think it's gonna be quite insidious for scams. So now more than ever, having a little bit of in-depth understanding of how things work on your system is going to be invaluable. So I hope you found this video helpful. Now we're going to do a lot more. We're going to do a real-time workshop. It's going to be set up as an event on the PC Security Channel Discord. I'd love for you to join in. You can do it by going to discord.tpsc.tech or clicking the link in description and then you're going to be redirected to the event. You can just select interested. We will be doing it this Saturday, 8 p.m. London time so morning or afternoon in the states please like and share this video if you enjoyed it thank you so much for watching and now to our sponsor this video is brought to you by crowdsec an open source intrusion prevention system. As we were just talking about getting hacked, CrowdSec can prevent hackers from accessing your network, doing a brute force attack on your system, DDoS, stuff like that. It is entirely free to join and use, and it is a community-based solution. They also recently launched CrowdSec Academy, which is a great way to learn more about this stuff. They have different courses. You can even get a little certification for each of these. And these are going to teach you how to take full advantage of this open source tool how to write different parsers and scenarios for it. It is multi-platform, you can install it on Linux or Windows, but as some of you have struggled with the Windows installation, I'm gonna do it right here, right now. So we can download the latest MSI file from their GitHub, just a normal installer. And once this is done, there are a couple of additional steps. You will need to create an account on their online platform, and then you can go ahead and enroll a new security engine. And this is the tricky part. You're gonna have to navigate to the CrowdSec directory, open a new terminal here, and then paste in that command. And then when you refresh the page, you're going to get a new request to enroll this machine onto your dashboard. And once you do that, boom, you've got a brand new system. We've got 37 scenarios built in for different CVEs, different vulnerabilities, backdoor attempts. You can also decide to use certain block lists so you can browse through available block lists. So if I wanna stop cybercrime related IPs from connecting to this computer, I can just subscribe to the Firehole tracker list. As you can see, this list contains command and control IP addresses. By default though, CrowdSec can only alert you. If you wanted to block things automatically using the Windows Firewall, well, you can go ahead and download the Windows Firewall Bouncer. This is also available on GitHub, so all you have to do again is just download the setup, run the installer, and you're good to go. You might want to restart the service to make sure everything is running. That's pretty much the install process. Feel free to ask any questions during the workshop we're going to be doing. Don't forget to tune in on Saturday for that. Thank you so much for watching. This is Leo, and as always, stay informed, stay secure. Thank <laughs> you.